uh, spend my time uh, being what's called a creative technologist. So I develop software and work a little bit with developing hardware that kind of fits inside uh, the arts and the music space uh, where kind of arts and technology meet. And a lot where uh, I work with a lot of musicians and artists. And in particular, I help a lot of musicians and artists who want to learn how to use more technology and more programming in what they do and uh, have very, very little programming experience themselves. So I spend a lot of time helping people learn how to program for the first time with the idea of having some kind of interactive media being the output of what they do. So if I am starting to explain like what a variable is in data types and I need to take it up a few notches, please feel free to you know tell me to speed along. And at the same time, if um, if you want to learn more and you don't exactly know what's going on and maybe something's too technical, please feel free to ask me to explain something more in depth as well. But in general, this is going to be about uh, just different arts programming platforms and uh, kind of the similarities and how they all work and uh, how you can get started with them, really. So, I don't know why, I keep setting up things around the idea that everyone has internet access and that always comes back to bite me. But all of these slides are up online on Speaker Deck, and all of the code that we'll be kind of uh, working towards is up on GitHub as well. Uh, so the idea was you could download it and have it <laughs> now, but that's probably not going to happen right now. Uh, and uh, but what it does is it's the same, the code is the same application uh, coded using the four different platforms that we'll be talking about today. So it has the same output on the screen, and it's really simple, it has no real point, it's essentially a screensaver, uh, but you can see how the same actions uh, have different calls to different libraries. So, what we will do is we're going to go through uh, processing. Uh, we'll go through processing the most in depth, and I'll, in a minute I'll talk about what that actually is. Uh, then also we'll go on to open frameworks, and then a little bit of Cinder and a little bit of Processing.py and kind of talk about how they're all similar to the processing uh, framework that we start with and then move on. So what is the arts programming um, kind of framework? So these are the four we're going to be working with or looking at today. And by far, processing is the one that's the oldest. So it's been around um, approaching something around a decade now. Uh, it's based on Java. And it is... It, it, kind of depending on how comfortable you are with programming, you can refer to it as different things. You can think of it as a programming language, um, and the, the interactive development environment that it comes with uh, might be all that you interact with, and you think of it as a language itself. Uh, at its core, processing is a Java library, and so you can do development with it inside Eclipse or whatever, and import it just like any other library, and work with it from there. Uh, so it still it can be quite powerful. So if you kind of look at it from the packaging that gets put around it for artists and musicians and people who are just learning how to program, it can look very simplistic and not like a, a very powerful tool. But it really, you can dig in and really do great things with it. Um, from there, uh, so the processing really was the, the inspiration for kind of what arts programming platforms are. And it was developed in parallel with Arduino. Uh, so it, it, it has the same kind of interactions, very similar documentation, a uh, very similar community around it. Uh, and then Open Frameworks was decided to jump off from processing uh, for all of the reasons that you use C++ instead of Java, essentially. Uh, it's, it can be faster, um, uh, you have other access, maybe certain libraries that you want to access that are C++ libraries. Uh, but you, uh, from a user standpoint, you have all of the jump you have from being a, writing Java to C++ to now also working with something like Xcode or Codeblocks or uh, Visual Studio. So a huge jump in kind of comfort level with uh, how much hand-holding will be inside the platform. Uh, Cinder then kind of grows on from Open Frameworks. Processing, being Java-based, is quite cross-platform. Uh, open Frameworks is very cross-platform as well, uh, and they work really hard to make sure the libraries that get used in the core parts of it are very strongly cross-platform libraries. Cinder uh, came out of a design studio that wanted the same kind of interactions and the same kinds of things that open frameworks can do, but they didn't really care about Windows. 
uh, they just wanted things that were going to be shiny and pretty on a Macintosh. And so these are Cinder uses, um, doesn't really care about cross-platform stuff, just makes sure things look really good in Cocoa, really. Uh, uh, and then uh, iOS as well. Processing.py is my favorite little thing. This is by far the least uh, developed thing. It doesn't even have, it has currently one developer. Just, it's just one guy who's checked in code into GitHub on it. But it's using uh, Python hooks uh, using Jython around the processing core library. Uh, and I mostly mention it uh, just because I would love for people to contribute to it. I, not that I've ever contributed to it either. No, I had a lot of time to play with it, but I like Python personally. I think it's a great language. And uh, especially when you're trying to teach introductory programming, introductory programming concepts, Python can bring a lot to the table that can make it a lot easier to learn than other things. Um, and so processing.py is very young, but could be a good way to, to move forward on things. So, I'll just say, anyone who came in after I've announced this who wants to follow along and work in processing, I have a USB key with the processing environment on it if you want to download it or move it over. You can also get it from processing.org, um, but it's just if you don't have Wi-Fi. Um, and all of these are free and open source, which I also mentioned. All under different licenses, but they all are free and open source. So what they all do is to provide native window, window handling. I got into these platforms a lot when I was doing um, a PhD research because you're interested in getting a certain program, you have kind of an algorithm that you want to get going, you want to test, there's a certain interaction, there's something going on, and you want to quickly deal with all the windowing and getting an application going. Um, you're not really making something to be deployed out to thousands or even you know, 10 users. It's really something that needs to get going once for proof of concept, and that's really where this stuff uh, gets really, really useful, and in particular does really simple native window handling. Uh, you can do native graphics and image quite easily, everything integrated to OpenGL. Uh, the interaction to the mouse and keyboard inputs are, are great, uh, and it's all based off of two main functions, basically, called setup and draw. And the, the whole idea, if you've, this is a, a, the similar kind of way things are done also with environments like the Arduino. The idea is you have two functions. The setup function, anything that you put inside the setup function is going to be stuff that's done once. Uh, and then anything that is put inside the draw function is something that will be done repeatedly at the frame rate of whatever your application is. So if you were to kind of set up initial variables and then inside the draw you would have an animation happen or something like that. Something that would get updated each time. So processing. Uh, has everyone who wanted a copy of processing gotten it? Hmm. Um, so I might try. I just yeah. go to that with domain, do I? Yeah, or it's on the oh, yeah, well. Yeah. 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 It's not the most reliable. Let's see if I can get this on my lap without the entire video going apart. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Okay. So, processing, you get from processing.org. Mm -hmm. yeah. Processing.org, um, it is Java. It works across. Um, Many OSs, and including Android, you can compile to. Um, it has its own IDE, uh, but you can also use it as just a Java library inside of Eclipse. Uh, it's released under uh, the LGPL license, and it's been around since 2001. So, processing, when you open it up, largely like this. So what you have is a really simple development environment where you write all of your code inside the white spot. Uh, any kind of error messages or print lines and things like that will get printed out below in the black. And then to run a sketch, you have a little play button at the top. Uh, you can stop it and then you have all your kind of simple functionality. Um, for dealing with file management. 
So when you first, so one thing you can do, or one thing that can be quite powerful for people who have never programmed anything before, um, you don't write a single line of code and you just hit run, and you already have a window. Um, you should not have an error message at the bottom. That's fun. <laughs> we'll ignore that for now. But you get a nice little, you just get a window, so the default window. Uh, that just gets created with any processing sketch. So what we can do is, if you do the command size, um, you can give um, two numbers uh, and call the size function, which just sets the size of the window, uh, and then uh, then you get a window size. So that's already starting off with just getting a window up and going. Um, without having to deal with, you know, GLUT and all those other things if you're doing kind of low-level OpenGL stuff. So, and then you can start doing things uh, like drawing little simple shapes, such as, uh, let's do a simple. Is that big enough? I can make the text bigger. Is that okay? are the x and y position, then the width and the height. And then we get a little ellipse up in the corner. And so it's just the, these really kind of simple commands between uh, setting up your size of your window and uh, then drawing objects to it. Today, uh, in our internet access issues, uh, there's really great documentation. Um, this is, I think, one of the processing kind of defies some of the stereotypes of open source programs, which it has a really strong community with just really, really user friendly, easy to access documentation that goes with it. And one nice thing with that is you can, it's all online, but if you're in a situation such as today where perhaps accessing external service is not the easiest of tasks, you can highlight anything, and then in a help, you can do find and reference. And it's a local copy of all the, doc of, all of the documentation. And so for any function, um, you get the name of the function, you get example code that you can just copy and paste straight into a processing sketch and have it produce that output. You get a longer description, um, the syntax of it, including uh, the different parameters that it takes, uh, any returns, and then links to any other related functions that uh, you might be interested in using along with it. So if you just look at the full language, um, you just there's a nice group together in the different topics, all of the different uh, 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 functions that are available to you inside of processing. So, so that's without using any of our void, any of our setup, or our draw, our looping functionality. And that's because when you just hit play, what processing does is it wraps together your code. If it doesn't see that you've um, uh, instantiated your uh, setup or, or draw function, it will wrap whatever you've done inside of a setup function for you. Um, just because when you have new programmers and the first thing you tell them to type is void, they want to know exactly what does void mean, and then you have to like waffle a little bit and be like, uh, let's get back to that at a later point in time. So that can be quite nice. Um, but we want to use So we stick it inside of our setup and our draw function. So now anything that happens inside of setup happens only one time. everything that goes inside of our draw function is going to get called um, repeatedly each frame, which in processing is about 30 frames per second, while uh, <coughs> open uh, frameworks tends to push it towards 60 frames per second. So we can start doing much more entertaining things here. So we have 
Right now we're just drawing a circle at, or an ellipse at 100 uh, and 100. So because we're working with graphics programs uh, and, and dealing with windowing, uh, our positive x's go left to right, but our positive y's start um, at the top and increase as they go down. So 0, 0, our origin, is up in this corner. Uh, increases this way, increases this way. So there are 100 and 100 in. So what we can do... If you use two variables called mouse x, and so that's mouse lowercase m with a capital x and mouse y, which is a lowercase m with a capital um, capital y, sorry, capital x, capital y, and uh, inside the, that variable is updated each frame to the current location of where your mouse is. And so with that little bit of <laughs> adding in, you now have, um, uh, you, you can pull in the information for where the mouse location is. So right now all we're doing is just drawing a uh, the same object, this ellipse um, object, every every frame wherever the mouse currently is. So even now when it's being still, it's repeatedly drawing on top of itself each frame. And also to note, you have the the one starting up in the corner uh, because it is the uh, it always starts the program with the mouse being set at zero zero. Uh, so you always get the kind of the initial one up there. So that's fun and all, maybe not the most functional, not the prettiest. So we can start doing colors. So the, the coloring in function is called fill. And you can, processing, this is the difference between processing and some of the other environments. Processing lets you use all kinds of color representations. Uh, it defaults to doing RGB values from 0 to 255. But if you, you're more comfortable with the text values or um, HSV, uh, all of those are fine. So just do you fill and then RGB from 0 to 255 is just the default, unless you tell it to, to have a different kind of color mode. Uh, and I now have an olive green ellipse. And just as a general tool that's quite useful, even if you're not using processing, is inside of tools, um, there's a thing called color selector. And it's just a little color display thing for you in which you select color and you get the HSV values along the side and the RGB and the hex um, all for you to, um, to plug into your processing sketch. Um, if you don't like to just randomly choose numbers and see what color comes out. How does the fill command know you that it's filling the ellipse if it's before the ellipse? Cool. It will fill whatever gets called. So it has to get called before. Okay. Because um, you're basically setting the color. Oh, you're setting the fill color. You're setting and then, the fill okay, color. Right, yeah. And then anything gotcha. we... So if you draw 12 different shapes <coughs> right, without changing before. fill, they'll all be gotcha. like that. Yeah. So one other command we have... In, oh, and I'll, uh, fill is an overloaded function where you can give it just one number, and it'll just be grayscale, if you wish, um, instead of giving it uh, three numbers being the same. So uh, one other function we have, let do it and set up first, is a function called background, which takes all of the same types of parameters that any color function would. And so this is just our background color of our, of our window. And so let's just make this a, make it white. So now we have a white background, so army green, uh, they look kind of like olives. Uh, but if you want to not have the, the trail and kind of the history of everything drawn for us, we can just move our background into our draw. And now each frame, the background color will essentially refresh our window. Then we um, set the fill color and the ellipse and then it looks like we just have a moving object instead of having kind of a trail of objects behind us. Which, while the trail can be fun, uh, has fewer applications than being able to just move something around. Why, why didn't the initial ellipse disappear as soon as you could just pull up? Because mouse X and mouse Y are set to zero, zero, and until you enter the window, it won't update those to any other number. So because this line of this yeah. mouse x, mouse y, is drawing, and so it does the setup, but then it immediately goes into the draw function. 
and mass x and mass y are set to zero, zero until you move the mass into the line. And then it so it's, uh, so it's, it's always doing that like, kind of overlap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could you get it to start off screen by using negative numbers? Um, forever, so, um, let's see. <laughs> I think it won't for the very first frame, so there might be the slightest of blips. Um, let's see. you can't change the, the mouse position so much, but you can set other objects off screen with negative things. So it's okay. not visible, but it must be something that keeps the mouse from getting messed around with like that. So it looks minus one side and minus one side. Yeah, so I think if we do um No no minus one side minus one side. So we can, uh, so you can import images, you can import videos, you can do all kinds of things um, using this kind of interaction with the basic set of function and the draw function. Uh, what I find then just really great, just just a just lovely, is the set of interaction functions. Um, uh, if you look at, in the documentation, there's a whole list of things called input. And so you have your mouse functions, your keyboard functions are the two primary ones, uh, where if there's parentheses after the end of the link, uh, at the end of the link, that's for documentation of a function or of a variable. And if we do um, like a mouse released, this function gets called whenever an event happens of that name. So whenever the mouse is pressed and then released, uh, the mouse released function will get called. So we can do void mouse released. creating a variable and setting up our background color as um, as a variable instead of a hard-coded number. And so we have void mouse released, and so this will happen whenever, this will get called whenever um, our mouse is clicked. So oh, we still have our moving, our floating away. Uh, ellipse there, but if we click the mouse now, uh, we have now functionality for when the mouse is pressed and then released again. And so we have that repeated inside of um, for mouse pressed, mouse dragged. Um, uh, so if you click and drag, if you press, if you release, and if you just move the mouse at all, all of those are kind of built-in functions that can uh, interact with the mouse. Oh, one other note for the kinds of media you can work with. So while, yeah, you can kind of play with shapes and build up graphics like that, and you can text fun functionality and fonts and all that um, are all built in. There's, if you actually get to the processing website ever, um, see if I'm connecting it, I have to right now. You'll see that there's, so this is the download page that I earlier just downloaded all of the versions of processing that come on the USB stick. Um, the current stable version is 1.5.1, and they've recently released uh, version 2 in alpha. Uh, now there are definitely some other bugs and weird things that can happen inside the alpha version, but in general, if you're doing, if you want to do video work and do real-time video manipulation, um, version 2 is much more stable for that, just for a footnote. Um, 
So in the GitHub, if you eventually get to that in uh, the repository, Uh, this, this is what the uh, so guided tour is just the is the Git repository, and so in here we have four examples. And so the README has examples um, of how you run each of these. Um, oh, that README is on a date. Uh, how you run each of these uh, little applications, and so the processing one is the most straightforward, where you just download or move, or, uh, or move over uh, the processing app onto your desktop, and then processing example, you double click uh, the .pde is the extension, and this is just the sample that I've written. So it's too big for the monitor, but um, all it does is it follows the mouse and draws some lines between the origin and the mouse location. And then when you click, um, it sets how thick the line is just based on how, um, on the Y position of the mouse. So again, not like a particularly useful application, but this is the, the application that I've been coded inside of Open Frameworks, um, processing.py and sender. So if you just want to glance at that um, code, um, so there's just about our setup function where we're just setting the size of the window in the background. Inside of draw, uh, we're setting the size of the stroke, the, the thickness of the line, and then we're drawing the line itself. And so that's what gets done repeatedly each frame. And then if mouse is the, if the mouse is pressed, we change the we reset what the stroke weight is according to the mouse Y position. And then if we oh I didn't demonstrate that mouse pressed. And all of the mouse functions, uh, you can check uh, the variable mouse button and test and see whether uh, if, if it, what particular button was, was pressed and integrate that into your application. And key pressed is you can check in the variable key and see what, um, to see what key was actually pressed um, and have, you know, a case switch if you want to have a, a whole bunch of options going on. So yeah, so in a nutshell, that's processing. So you have uh, a nice package together, uh, development environment that is uh, really quite basic and easy to use. It has all the core functionality that you need, um, where you have errors at the bottom. You can do print lines and things like that to the bottom. Um, everything's Java. Uh, you can import up external libraries. Uh, but uh, I don't know if you are a Java developer, um, you're kind of sitting several levels inside of a inside of a class, and so it can be kind of confusing. And if you're already a Java developer, I would encourage. And processing is still really great and really useful. Uh, you just might want to look into the using Java uh, or using processing inside of Eclipse kinds of things, um, and use it as just as as a library unto itself. So. Any questions over processing? Um, oh, the and the library has a really or the whole it has a really strong community um, and a really great, very friendly community as well. Um, you don't have yeah. Can I see the example again? Because I've spent 15 minutes downloading the <laughs> runtime application and unzipping everything. <laughs> yeah. Didn't quite get time to type it in. So this is the one that we, this is the little olive dragging one, right. our floating olive. And then um, uh, in the, the GitHub is linked to from the landing page for this. Mm. And the slides are up on the landing page as well, and the, the coverage stuff. Uh, um, yeah, I can, I'll leave that up for a second. Um, uh, but yeah, so uh, processing also has a really strong, very friendly community um, and lots of forums and online support uh, that in particular, um, some of the negative tropes that come out of uh, other software development communities you don't find so much. Uh, there's not kind of negative showboating so much in the forums. It can be a bit more of a supportive space, uh, which people like, um, especially as it, it is meant to be 
largely, at least this version of processing where you're using kind of this, this environment is meant to be you're kind of starting off learning how to program the thing. So. No, I'm all right. You're all right? Okay. So, on to Open Frameworks. So, Open Frameworks is you'll see, it looks, um, the structure of the library itself is, just, is very much built on top of processing um, in such a way that actually it can trip you up the differences where you expect certain commands to be there and they're not if you're used to processing. Um, so it's all C++. Um, again, um, it's kind of across all standard operating systems. Uh, Android, but also can do an uh, iOS uh, development in it as well and create uh, people kind of, it can be a good environment for doing kind of simple games uh, for iPad and iPhone things. Um, it does not come with its own IDE, which means if you are, you, you are, have to kind of choose your favorite IDE that you like to work with. And that's great if you already have a favorite IDE that you like to work with. Um, it can be a bit daunting if you are on a Mac and you've only ever worked with something like processing, and now you have to open up Xcode, and you have an explosion of things going on, and even for seasoned developers, Xcode's such a pain, along with its friends. Um, but so the way it works, because to keep it cross-platform, now this, seems, this will seem quite a bit weird, especially if you're kind of used to more Linux-type development cycles, is you don't get a bunch of libraries and have them uh, distributed through some kind of package management system uh, and have, you know, different bits that you have sitting on your machine and then you write code that over that goes over all of them and, and calls them uh, and links them in. Instead, you will have one giant piece of source code that you download and you compile right then and there each time you want to run it on your, uh, each time you do a compilation cycle. So basically, Open Frameworks comes with nothing compiled which is the part of the way it keeps itself open. And in meticulously, they uh, put together uh, the project settings for each of the different IDEs that they support. And you download that whole project setting and hit run on that. So you have a little bit of magic going behind the scenes because good luck if you ever mess up your, your, your settings uh, inside of your IDE. Um, but that's kind of, that can be really, really weird if you are not used to that way of going around things. So yeah, it's been around since about 2008. Um, it's open source as well, but while processing was LGPL, this one's MIT license. So Open Frameworks also has a lot of support online. This is um, this is their website, which doesn't scale down very well. Um, with lots of examples and a wiki, and again, another good uh, strong set of forums and, and mailing lists and everything. Um, Internet. I do. And again, um, uh, HTML nicely, nicely enough uh, documentation for things. Uh, to keep the namespace separate, everything, all of the functions have OF in front of them for open frameworks. But so we'll take a look at what it looks like. So if you look, at, so once you download it, you'll see that because you have nothing compiled and everything comes to you as source that gets compiled um, it's basically at runtime. You'll download a set of folders that generally look like this, where you have kind of the core bits of open frameworks inside of libs. Um, all of the kind of uh, libraries and, and even ex uh, wrappers of other libraries that give it a similar syntax kind of feel as open frameworks get, are called add-ons within, within open frameworks. And so and they get uh, OFX put in front of them for being extensions. And so inside of add-ons is, so file structure is very, very important because you don't want to touch the settings inside of your IDE and so everything needs to be set to a relative file path and it's all very important before things go horribly, horribly wrong. And so um, add-ons sit inside of this folder and then it's important, the file structure that's kept from there. For them. And in general, what you do uh, is everything, all of your own code, uh, you're gonna work with inside of apps and then inside of another folder, typically called something like my apps, can be called whatever you want. And then you have your individual projects in there. And so you also have add-on examples and examples um, which are all distributed with 
open frameworks, including the empty example, which is the way that you would create your own new project, is you would take the empty example, you basically duplicate it, rename it um, in the way that you need to for whatever development environment you're using, and then work from there. So the absolutely horrible. So this is really difficult to now to like see. But does anyone know how to get rid of this column? Is that possible? Anyone know how this thing works? <laughs> <laughs> so we have um uh, where list go? Oh yeah there's bits to the left of that that you can't see to turn it off. Yeah. Oh there used to be my file list. What happened to my I think it's off the screen. Yeah, it's slightly off the screen to the right of editor. So press the little arrows next to editor down there. Uh, next to top editor. Top right. Top right. Top right. Yeah, little arrows pointing right. Yeah. Click right there. Uh, I can see that. It's the organizer here. No? No. It's the view thingy. Hide inspector. Hide inspector. Yeah. There we go. What happened to the other side? Same way, but then it might be the other one. So, no, I was fine. Yeah. First one. Okay. Yeah. So tiny. We'll get it out of the full screen business. Oh, there we go. That arrow. That's all I wanted. I wanted this arrow. So we have, uh, so inside each of our open frameworks um, projects is you have a folder called source. Inside of any of these, um, they all have a folder called source. And then at the same level, you have your, your project stuff. And so uh, inside of source, we have three main files. Mm -hmm. One called main, three files, and inside and so inside of main is where we do our initial setup of our window, uh, and then inside of the line for OF run app is where you put the name of your class of whatever the name of your project is. A convention that annoys me a lot inside of the Open Framework community is the all of the default examples all call themselves test app. So it's all testapp.cpp and testapp.h, um, every single one of them. <laughs> I I find this, I, I don't understand why. And so I always <laughs> rename mine to a useful file name instead of just saying testapp. Um, but normally it says new testapp there. Um, but I actually called my file something useful. And so um, uh, fairly standard stuff. For C++, so we have a, a class that is an extension of the, the base application for open frameworks. Um, these are kinds of the things that you don't see inside the processing uh, development um, environment, but if you were to use Eclipse, you would see that all processing um, uh, applications are uh, extensions of the P applet class for processing applet. Uh, so we just have our setup uh, draw. There's an update function as well you can use. Uh, which just gets called uh, immediately before the draw function, each frame. And then we have all the same kind of stuff, the key press, the, the mouse moved, all of those kinds of things uh, for uh, the same kind of functionality. When the mouse is moved, that function is called, and then you can put in your code and have it do whatever you want accordingly. And so inside of our C++ file, then we just have our code. So this all does the same stuff. So now that I am, there we go. Look at that, I'm using Xcode. Uh, so now we can, uh, uh, so just to briefly go through this, so if we remind ourselves that the, the here's the other process over there. Sorry, I just 
to show what we did before in the so said in, in processing before we were just we had our we had a background color uh, in setup we just made a window we gave it a color and then we were drawing lines between the or we set the, the stroke color uh, and then we were drawing a line between the origin at 0, 0 and the current location of the mouse. And then if the mouse was pressed, we would just change the stroke weight. And if a key was pressed, we'd um, reset the background to clarity. <coughs> so that's what it looks like inside of processing. Inside of open frameworks, uh, again, we have a... Um, uh, we have a variable that we are setting to a background color. Uh, open frameworks by default actually does do the background each frame. So unlike processing where by default you will have a trail of things dragged around your screen and open frameworks by default you won't. So we explicitly tell it to let us draw on top of our previous frame and then we set our background color. And then inside of draw, we're setting our color and then we are drawing our line, things that all look very similar um, with minor changes in, uh, between processing and open frameworks. Uh, again, uh, the doing, uh, detecting if a key was pressed uh, looks uh, very, very, very similar to processing. And then inside of mouse pressed, we're setting the line width. Um, and we don't have things sitting in nice little variables for us, such as the, uh, uh, the screen width and height and things like that. We can access inside of variables inside of processing but we just have an accessor function inside of Open Frameworks that we can get to. So let me just run that. We have what essentially looks like the same program. Um, this one is running at 60 frames per second instead of about 30 though, but it has all the same functionality. It doesn't have just weird things. It doesn't have a rounded, like, beveled edge on the stroke, which processing does. So. Okay. So, cinder and processing.py so I'm just the time. So, cinder um, is from libcinder.org. It kind of functions similar to kind of the workflow is similar to open frameworks. Uh, but again, while they say it's cross-platform and available on Windows, it's kind of like a third of the feature set is available on Windows. It's basically a, a, an o, a OS X, iOS uh, platform. And then being then primarily an Xcode. And then has a simplified BSD license instead of the MIT license of uh, open frameworks or LGPL of processing and it's much younger, so um, at least, I don't know how long it, it existed before it existed on GitHub, but the first commit was just a couple of years ago. So, and so the sender example is um, inside of here as well, um, in the example code, if you want to poke at it later. And again, the README that's included with it will uh, walk you through how you, do you download it and that you need to create a new project and import that C file, the C++ file, to, to use it. Um, so we won't go into that too much. Um, I'll leave that to look at in your own time. And instead, I'll jump to processing.py. So processing.py is um, getting to write in Python, but it uses Python to compile again your Python code against Java. Uh, is then fairly uh, cross-platform. Uh, again, no no specified IDE in the slightest. Uh, so you are just doing kind of a command line uh, compilation against your files and Apache license and is. Uh, Again, very young, with basically one guy that's been working on this project. But so the processing.py example 
So now we're looking at Python instead of C++ or, um, or Java. Uh, so uh, goodbye data types. Uh, so we just have a thing called background, called PG, and it is a 30. Uh, so we have uh, uh, function definitions, uh, just called setup and draw, and then basically take all of the processing documentation and look at the code and think, how would I write the same thing in Python? And that's pretty much it. So take off the semicolons, um, take off the data types uh, in front of variables, and you're pretty much good to go. So this looks pretty much the same, just Python, of the Java. Things. But you have a little bit more of a pain because you need to uh, to run it, you need to compile it against the uh, the processing.py jar, which again the readme um, tells you, but you just need to uh, be in the is it mean download processing.py. You just need to be inside uh, this folder, um, or or write out the path to this folder so that you can get to this jar file is the important thing. And then, but it is all documented on the processing pipe website. All oh, fun. It did weird things with the projector. Cool. <laughs> so, not the most stable out of all the platforms we've looked at. And platforms and libraries, but they all kind of exist for the same function. It's an easy way to get windowing going quickly and have interaction inside of an application. While you could write and wrap up and deploy an application from these uh, platforms, it's not necessarily what they were developed for, um, but if you are interested in doing some hardware hacking, maybe working with like Arduino or the Connect, these things are really, really set and ready to go to play with those kinds of technologies. Um, Basically, processing frustrations that come with processing can be summed up with Java. Um, it, all of these are kind of more language-dependent issues than anything else. So processing is written in Java. Java has some issues. Java has, has some advantages. Processing inherits all of those. Um, but it has a really great community. It's the most stable out of all of these. Um, and you can move into Eclipse um, if you don't need such a simplified IDE. They call their program Sketches. And actually, it can be really great to think in that way. If you have something you do want to, like, kind of an idea to sketch out a certain interaction, it's almost like you can make an interactive wireframe of something really easily. Um, processing may be your tool. Open frameworks, again, all of the power and complaints of C. Um, but again, it's quite stable um, and useful, but you sometimes. Um, because they make sure everything stays very cross-platform, it's kind of like jack of all trades, master of none. So it doesn't do as good as perhaps some other native OS uh, specific libraries uh, because of the cross-platformness. That's where Cinder comes in, at least for the Mac side. Um, Processing.py uh, just had a lovely uh, demonstration of its instabilities <laughs> and uh, the ways it can fall over. Uh, but I personally, I, I love having a reason to, to program in Python. I rather enjoy it. Um, and so processing.py, I'm just trying to get people to pick it up and maybe help with those stability issues. And perhaps it'll be a more reliable tool in the future. Um, so yeah, they all kind of vary in in level of noob appeal, you could say. Um, they can be really great for these kind of these Raspberry Pi kind of things where you're really trying to introduce new people to coding. Uh, they can be really, really great tools for that. Uh, so yeah, and that is me. And that is, yeah, that's about time, I think. Um, if there's any quick questions at all, I'd be happy to 
um, either just kind of one-on-one, -on -one, or if anyone has a question now at all over anything. Um, otherwise, that's my email and Twitter and stuff. Have you uh, played with the plugins for open frameworks for mobiles, for um, iPhone? No, I haven't. I played with processing for Android, um, which actually, actually there have, there's some pluses with the processing for Android over the processing for um, uh, a desktop OS. Uh, it has, someone's ported the native GUI elements so that you can use them from a library inside of processing. While it's really hard to get native GUI elements inside of processing on a desktop. And so in that way, actually the Android, the mobile version of processing is a bit nicer to work with because you, can, you don't have to write a button and try to make it look not like Flash. <laughs> but not, not the open framework side or the iOS side, no. I kind of said it, but um, if you were picking um, just one of those environments to teach people who are new to programming, would you still pick just processing? I would still pick processing, and that's almost entirely down to the fact that open frame, well, so C++ is just not, that doesn't mean to make someone learn programming in C++ first, <laughs> um, but then to make them learn that inside of some behemoth program like Visual Studio or Xcode, those are the main reasons I wanted to. Not because it's not a powerful thing with great, not a good library. It's kind of the tools that you need to work with that library are not, not simply processing.